The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Now on that same day when Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene, two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus. It was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still looking sad. And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of an angel who said that he was alive, and some of those who were there with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. And then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all of Scripture. And as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it's evening and the day is now nearly over. And so he went to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, we were talk- while he was talking with us on the road? While he was opening the scripture to us, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together and they were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road, how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. Christ. I invite you to be seated. A few years back, we went to what's called the Trisignautical Conference. That's a big word for all the synods in Texas or all the church bodies in Texas where they send all their pastors together to do a time of learning. We uh, have some fellowship and worship, and we always invite a key speaker. And one year, we invited this gentleman named Leonard Sweet, who's an author and a theologian. And uh, he wrote this one book that really captivated my attention at the time called Tablet to Table. And I have it in my office if you want to take a look at it. Um, uh, But in this book, it talked a lot about food. And as I was reading today's gospel lesson, preparing and studying, I couldn't get this book out of my head because some things that he said in there really really, uh, uh, resonated with me even years ago, and they came back. So one of the things he talked about in this book was he challenged another theologian if he could whittle down the Old Testament in three sentences. Can you... Can you, can you tell me what the Old Testament's about in three sentences? And so the guy says, sure. He goes, they tried to kill us. We survived. Let's eat. They tried to kill us. We survived. Let's eat. And he goes, okay, what about the New Testament? And he goes, that's easy. I love you. I forgive you. You got it. Look, you guys are good. Yeah. So, uh, so this, this, this whole concept about food is pretty big within the biblical witness as in and of itself. In fact... One of the first things God says to humanity, to the first humans, is eat freely. One of the last things in Revelations that God says is drink freely. Clearly, food is important. Not only does it nourish us, and and, and, and we can have all kinds of flavors, and we have to do this three times a day, sometimes more, snacks in between, the like, but there's also a story that comes with that food. And especially the story that comes with the food that we receive here today. This is pretty important. It's the resurrection story. And for Luke, food and resurrection kind of go hand in hand. Let me tell you about a couple of times that Luke does this. In chapter 8, we have the story of Jairus' daughter. 
You might remember this story. She's sick. Jairus comes forward, asks Jesus to heal her, come save her. And Jesus says, okay. And on the way, he encounters a crowd, and he's inside this crowd, and some woman starts to tug on the cloak of his uh, 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 tassels on his cloak, and, uh, and she ends up getting healed, and then they have this conversation, and he finally leaves the crowd, and somebody says, it's too late. Jairus' daughter has died, and Jesus says, don't be afraid, which would make a really great sermon, but he says, don't be afraid, just believe she will be saved. And he goes to the house and he takes the hand of Jairus' daughter, the Holy Spirit enters her, and then she is resurrected, and the next thing he says is, give her something to eat. Food, resurrection. The next time Luke talks about this is when Jesus in chapter 14 is giving this parable about weddings and stuff to a bunch of people who are having a complication about who they should invite to meals, and he says, if you're gonna have a lunch, don't just invite your friends and your relatives and your loved ones, because you're going to expect something from them. I mean, when they come in, they're gonna, you're going to want them to praise you for whatever the dish you created or how beautiful the drapes are or how lovely your home is. You're going to want them to pay you back for something. In fact, when you have a lunch, you should invite the outcast, invite the cripple, invite the lame, invite the person that nobody wants to touch or talk to because they can't repay you. Be of service to this person because the blessings that you receive happen in the resurrection, food, resurrection. The next story happens in the 15th chapter of Luke whenever he's talking about the prodigal son. And we all know the story about the boy that takes his inheritance and takes off, right? But the, but the beautiful image that I always have in my head is him face to face with Wilbur the pig, you know, and he's eating the slop that the pig's eating because that's all that he has access to, those pig pods and stuff. And all of a sudden his mind is opened. He has his own little resurrection moment right there, and he heads home, and what was lost is now found. What was dead is now alive, food, resurrection. Yesterday, we had our synod assembly, and they were studying from the book of Acts, which Luke also wrote. And the scripture that they were studying comes from Acts 9, and it's uh, the conversion of Paul from Saul. And you know the part where he gets blind and there's another person in there having to go take care of him and stuff. But the very end is the part that most people remember where the scales fall from his eyes, beautiful image. But it's the next two things that happen that I want to bring up. He's baptized and then he gets something to eat. He has his own resurrection experience in this moment. Food and resurrection is pretty central to the whole biblical story and especially to our gospel lesson today. It's central to what we do here as Lutherans at Abiding Presence at every single worship experience. We have the meal. It's in the middle. It's part of the pattern of worship. And you know we have a pattern, right? Have you ever experienced it before? If you're not Lutheran, I'm about to teach you something, so just hold on. We have four points to our worship service. We gather, word, meal, sin. Say that with me. Gather, word, meal, sin. You just graduated seminary. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> The best way I've ever heard this described came from Gay Hank, who uh, passed away last year, and she was our communications person. She used to teach all the welcome team what this meant. And I love how she would describe this. She says, think of church and worship like a dinner party. Okay, Gay, go on, go on. She says, you're gathered together, everybody. Like, all of a sudden, the doorbell rings. Ding dong. And you go to answer the door. like, hey, how you doing? Oh, it's so good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Can I take your coat? Sure, come on in, come on in. And you have them have a seat, and they're sitting there talking with a couple other people. Ding dong, you go back to the door. Hey, so and so, look who's here. Oh, yeah, you know, and you're, you're greeting them, you're talking with them, you're, you're just kind of getting established, you're finding your seat. The gathering at worship is the same thing. It's not just whenever you're sitting in the pew. It happens at the doorway, she says. When somebody's walking in, you're there to welcome them, and you give them what they need for worship, and you show them where they're going to be sitting, sitting and, and then worship starts with music, and then we always gather with God at the font or at the confession and absolution. And then comes the word portion of worship. And she says, this is the part of the dinner party where everybody's sitting around in the living space and they're all sitting on the couch and they're talking and they're like, you know, like, How, how's the job? How are the kids? I heard you had a wedding last weekend. Yes. And uh, which they really did. Um, uh, so that you, you start having great conversations, deeper conversations. You, you rekindle those friendships, those relationships that you may have had along the way. And here the word happens where we start hearing stories ourselves, but they come from the pulpit 
We listen to those ancient stories of Scripture. We get the New Testament stories from our, from our apostles and then the gospel. And you always get a phenomenal sermon, right? <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. And then comes the meal portion. And this is where Gay says that you would sit around a table, invite everybody, it's time to eat. And you all sit down at the table. You can feel the mood start to shift a little bit. The stories come a little bit different. You pause. You thank everybody for coming. You say a prayer. And then people start passing food. And the conversation starts to get more intimate. It's more one-on-one with the people sitting right next to you. And you're eating. You're consuming. You're changing. It is a beautiful moment. The same thing happens here. We gather around this table. And everybody gets the same thing. The same amount of bread, the same amount of wine, the same amount of Christ, the same resurrection experience. It's an intimate moment, and we are changed. And then comes the sending. And Gay would say that you go get their coats, and you wish them well. You stand at the door, and you wave goodbye to them. And then all of a sudden, you turn around, and you talk with your family. You're like, wasn't that fun? We should do this again. And those people that are driving home, they're in their car going, that was so neat. It was great seeing so, so-and-so. You know what? We should do this. Yes, we should do it every week. Yes, we should do it every, every Sunday, right? Yes. No, we should, do this. we should do this again. Oh, that was so nice. Here the sending happens whenever we have that final blessing and we go forth out to share the good news of God in Christ Jesus. Now, if you look at our um, gospel today, the road to Emmaus story is a worship experience. There's two of them talking. A third comes together and they gather together. They welcome each other. They share some pleasantries. And then they have a time of word where Jesus is basically unfolding scripture for them and their minds are opening up. And then they sit down and they have this meal. And that's whenever they have this resurrection experience and they see Christ for who he truly is. And he vanishes. And then what do they do? They're sent forth to go share it with others. And they go tell the other disciples what they have just experienced in the breaking of the bread, food, resurrection. Now, if you're like me, I take about six steps out of this building and I cross the threshold underneath the overhang part. I don't know what it's called, but it's right outside the doors. Portico, is that what it is? There you go. Three services, I finally have the word. Yeah, I take six steps outside and all of a sudden I forget why I gathered, what I heard, what I preached, uh, and why I've been sent forth. And I start thinking about H-E-B and, and the traffic patterns and uh, this person that I need to get something from or this person that I don't want to get anything from or all these other problems that are going on, and I turn off my resurrection experience. I turn it off. And I don't know if you're like that, but that's definitely me because on step seven, eight, and nine, I'm caught up in me. I'm no longer thinking about what I had just got through experiencing here. This intimate meal that we are about to share is not meant to stay in this space. It's meant to go out and be given to other people. Not in the sense that you're going to walk around with wafers feeding people, but when you look at them to share Christ with them. When you're passing them on the road to give them Christ. To see Christ in them. To let them know you're changed. You have this resurrection experience. Give it to them. But it takes intentionality on step seven and eight and nine as you leave from here. So as you go forth from here, I hope that you are changed by the resurrection experience that we have have in the breaking of the bread. Amen.